Oh, let me see something here. You know what? Let me refresh. Let me refresh it. Okay. Let me hit refresh. Okay. So you're only seeing one shot. You're seeing a free freeze frame here. All right. So so. Okay, so I'm on a freeze here. I'm going to close out OBS and start it again, okay? I've had to do that before.
Okay. First thing that struck me was how it looks. It takes you by surprise because it, it breaks from the norm. My name is Brody Neal. I'm a furniture designer. Good evening. The League of Women Voters of Walpole, Westwood, and Dedham. Dedham keeps falling off our banner. Welcome you to this town hall tonight. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan organization. That means we neither support nor oppose any political party or candidate. We do, however, take stands on issues after 
careful study. Membership in the league is open to all men and women 16 years of age. I said 16, one six years old. Um, if you want information about the League of Women Voters, you can get some cards outside or contact anybody that has a league pin or sticker. We first worked with the Attorney General's Office on human trafficking. We wanted to have a forum and we were lost as to where to go. The AG's office provided such wonderful information with speakers and resources that we had a phenomenal forum and we've taken action after that. So we're working very hard on the human trafficking situation in our communities. I met Mara Healy at a friend's holiday party. A group of us were talking about pipeline issues. I know this is not new to you folks. We were squished in the corner of the kitchen up by the refrigerator, and we were all complaining about what was happening to our poor communities. And Mara Healy said, I think I could do something about that. Let, let me work on that. And I thought, oh, she's just really, you know, trying to be nice to these party guests, and I didn't think any more of it. Well, she did do something about it in a big way, and we are very thankful. Mara ran to be the people's lawyer. You will hear about her work in the last two years pursuing justice. She has been a leader in our state and even at the national level. Back to our issues. We share concerns with the AG that range from voter protection to domestic violence to gun safety, and I could go on and on. Um, we invited her here tonight to talk about these issues and much more. She will give a presentation and then she will answer your questions. So ladies and gentlemen, your Attorney General, Mara Healy. Um, good evening, and Marcia, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the introduction, and I want to say to the League of Women Voters from Westwood and Walpole and Dedham, who sponsored tonight's event, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. It's, uh, it's great to be here with all of you, especially at this time. I also want to thank, in particular, I just saw Jen Karnakis at the door. Um, thank you, and... Uh, Tamara Dalton and Denise Schultz, who are among other people who helped put tonight's event together. So our team's really happy to be here. I always love doing these town halls. I think this is about my 15th in the state since, since November. And it's just been a great opportunity to have a conversation with real people about real issues and the work that we collectively need to do. So thanks very much. Um, I want to start by just sort of you know, saying and acknowledging that these are really challenging and difficult times. I get it. We all wake up every day to the news or we go to bed at night. And some of it's unimaginable, actually. And some of what I think we're experiencing as a country is really unprecedented. Um, some of it, I'm looking at Andrew Sullivan, who uh, grew up not far from here and understands a little bit about context and is a historian. You know, some of this we've seen before. But my point to all of you here tonight, and the conversation I want to have is a conversation about what we can do. Because I fundamentally believe that everything is local in this country, and that for transformational change to happen for the sake of our communities, our state, our nation, and indeed our world, it's up to each and every one of us to engage regularly in ways large and small, and that it actually makes a difference. So. Let's talk a little bit about that, um, because I think this is a collective effort. Now, look, for those of you uh, who I, I had the pleasure of meeting some of you 
back three, four years ago when I was running to be the people's lawyer. You understand that that, that, that continues to be what drives me in my approach to the office. It's to get up and go to work each day. I work with a wonderful team of folks in the Attorney General's offices, Attorney General's office, I should say offices, because we do have four uh, offices around the state. And our job is to enforce the laws and to stand up for people's rights and interests. And that continues to be what drives the work of the office. Now, I know that there are certain things that are always in the headlines, um, particularly our actions against our current president. But there's, um, and we'll talk about that. We will talk about that. But I want you to know that as much as anything, what gives me the greatest satisfaction is when I know that a mediator on our hotline was able to help a family navigate through a difficult health insurance coverage issue. Or one of our consumer lawyers was able to get after a car dealership that sold a bad car to a customer or an entity that made a bad loan uh, to somebody and that were able to, to recover help. Sometimes it's as little as a couple hundred bucks or 700 bucks or 900 bucks. Every week I get a report detailing what the recoveries have been and what people have done. And I got to tell you that that's what matters to me because I look at our office as the last place that people can go for help. You know, and there are a lot of people out there who are feeling vulnerable right now, who are feeling voiceless, who may not think that there's anybody out there working for them or fighting for them. And I just want you to know that that uh, remains the core mission of the Attorney General's office, is to get out there and get after it every day. Yes, to enforce the laws, but it's always in the interest of the people that I'm proudly elected to serve. So. <laughs> So, um, you know, a little bit more about that because, um, you know, I, I, I will talk about some of the actions against the federal administration, but I do want you to know, I just, I was um, recalling the story of uh, Danielle. Danielle is typical of, of, of some of the folks that we've worked with in our office over the last several months. Danielle went to a school to become a medical technician. And she ended up going to the school because it advertised a great career with terrific salary and job placement opportunities. And when she ended up enrolling in this program, she, of course, took on tens of thousands of dollars of debt. And this was a, a school that used a lot of high-pressure sales tactics to get her to sign on the dotted line to take on that big loan. And so she was stuck with a situation where she ended up going through this program she didn't even finish the program because it turned out the program was really worthless. And she was stuck with boatloads of debt. And our office went after that entity, enforced the law, and ultimately got a discharge of her loan. And, you know, that's the kind of work that we do in our office. In Norfolk County alone, I think we're, I just asked my team for the statistics because I, I knew I was coming here. There are a thousand students that we've worked with in Norfolk County alone this year to get over six and a half million dollars in student don loan debt relief. So I want you to know that because, you know, one of the things I recognized when I started is student loans, $1.3 trillion and growing in this country. It's an absolute drag, not only on our families and our students, but ultimately on our economy. So I set up a student loan assistance unit in the office. If you or a family member or grandchild um, is facing student loan debt in an amount that, you know, you're afraid you're going to default or maybe you're in default, please contact my office because we are working regularly with students and families on better repayment plans. That's an example of the work that your attorney general, attorney's general office does. Um, I mentioned some of the work around some of the bread and butter issues, you know, you probably wouldn't believe this, but just this year alone, we've recovered nearly $2 million for 373 of your neighbors who were taken advantage of by subprime car loans. That's a lot of money. Also, wage theft and debt collection. I have to look at my cards because I can't keep all these numbers in my head. But, you know, wage theft, um, in the last two weeks alone, we helped return $85,000 to workers who were stiffed by their employers who did not get the wages that they were due. And those are the kinds of calls that we take and the kinds of actions we can take as an office. Now, um, I know an issue that probably many of you are all too 
familiar with. Anybody, um, anybody the victim of, of the data breach at Equifax? Yeah, just about everybody is. Actually, you all are, because the fact of the matter is uh, all these credit reporting agencies compile this information. And as you may have seen, my office, our office was the very first to sue Equifax for its really outrageous and egregious conduct, collecting our personal information, storing it in this digital warehouse, and then basically leaving the back door open so the criminals could come in. And not only did we sue, and we will hold them accountable, but more importantly, I've supported and helped draft legislation here that will reform the credit reporting agency once and for all. That's the work of the Attorney General's office. You know, I just, uh, I just came up the road. I was down in Fall River this afternoon, and I was at the Boys and Girls Club there, which is always a great place to be. Um, it was after school, and the kids were coming in, and they were down in the computer lab, and some were in the gym, and others were in a, in a workshop. But, you know, that's what the work is about, isn't it? It's about making sure that those kids have the kind of future and the kind of opportunities that our parents and our grandparents wanted for all of us. But the reason I was there was not to play uh, with the kids, although I did plenty of that. Um, I didn't play basketball today. I played pool. Um, but it was there, I was there for a, a roundtable on what's happening right now on the ground with regard to the opioid crisis. I want you to know, folks, this remains my top priority. And we've worked hard over the last couple of years to get at this issue from a number of, of perspectives. I know, though, that 2,000 people died last year in Massachusetts. That doesn't begin to actually account for the toll. As I meet so many grandparents who find themselves raising grandchildren, as I visit uh, hospitals where uh, little ones are born addicted, as I think about the parents and the sons and daughters who've left work or taken time off to care for a loved one in the throes of addiction, I know the toll that this crisis continues to take on our families and on our community. So I want you to know that it is my top priority and here's what I'm doing. Uh, recently I announced that there was an expanded investigation that my office, along with other state AGs from around the country, are engaged in uh, regarding the opioid manufacturers and distributors. It's the largest public health investigation of its kind and I want you to know the goal of our investigation is to get answers, to get to the bottom of this. I want to know what those manufacturers and distributors knew about the products they were pushing, the harm that they may cause, and what they chose to disclose or not disclose to the public. We need answers. I'm limited in what I can say, obviously, because this matter is under investigation. But I want you to know that uh, this has been an all-out, all-consuming effort. It will continue to be. Um, in this age of political divisiveness, I'm heartened to say that there are 40 Democrat and Republican AGs, we're all working together to get to the bottom of this. And it starts with, with this investigation. But look, uh, we, look to make, we look to make Narcan available to first responders right out of the gate when the manufacturer was jacking up the price. I reached out, my office did, and we secured an agreement and got some funding. I kicked in some funding as well that enabled Narcan to be available through uh, a bulk purchasing plan to all first responders in the state. Unfortunately, we just had to re-up that, but it's so important because that's, uh, that's what is saving lives out there. Treatment continues to be an issue. I continue to advocate for more and better treatment, more beds, more step-down uh, facilities and plans for people. Um, again, that was the subject of some discussion today. I also think it's really important, though, that you know, while we've changed some of the prescribing practices, you know my office went after some of the prescribers over the last couple of years who were prescribing um, in ways that were harmful, we believe, that led to pills being diverted into the market. Um, it's really important that we focus on prevention and education. And so I announced earlier this year that we had reached out and through a partnership with GE and my office and Chris Heron, we launched a new initiative, it's called Project Here. And what Project Here is, is a program that's gonna be in every public middle school in the state of Massachusetts, teaching young people about health and wellness and empowering them with the skills, with the resources, with the background to deal with 
uh, potential um, uh, drug use or uh, really about combating uh, the opioid epidemic and teaching young people about, about opioids and, and other things that, that will get in their way. So, you know, well, we've got to do everything we can to uh, deal with and help those who are sick and their families. Um, we also need to, to really stop addiction before it starts. And so I am focused on today's third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh graders, and I'm really excited about that initiative. So that's a little bit of um, what I know is on the minds of, of so many people as I go around, um, as I go around the state. But let me, um, let me get back to what I know some are interested in, and that is our work vis-a-vis -vis the federal government. And, you know, I'm a government lawyer. I never uh, imagined that I would find myself suing our own government as much as we are. But, you know, who is here, who is here at the Women's March? Anybody here in Boston or elsewhere? Did you go to the Women's March? We had a lot of women and men at the Women's March, which was fantastic. So you may recall that when I stood on the Common uh, for the Women's March, my message to Donald Trump was, we'll see you in court. Now, I never thought it would be so soon or so often, but my job as your attorney general is to stand up and enforce the law and to make sure that the rule of law is, is upheld because I fundamentally believe that our whole democracy falls apart. Our whole government falls apart if we don't have respect for the rule of law. And unfortunately, right now, we've got a president who continues to show a callous disregard for the rule of law. So that's why we're suing them, because no one is above the law, even the President of the United States. And I want to be clear. You know, whenever there's an executive order, whenever there's some announcement out of DC, the first question I ask myself is, what does this mean for Massachusetts? What does it mean for our residents? What does it mean for our businesses? What does it mean for our economy? And, you know, yeah, that's why I turned around the other day and we sue Donald Trump and his administration over their executive order on health care. You better believe it. If he seeks to take away health care from millions and millions of Americans, sabotage our, our, sabotage our health care market, you better believe it. We're going to see him in court and we're going to win because that is illegal and unconstitutional what he's doing. We know. We know how important access to health care is here in Massachusetts. We pioneered it, by the way, in a bipartisan way, didn't we? You know, go back a couple weeks ago when they came out with that rule, two rules actually, on contraception. They want to allow a boss to make decisions that should be left to a woman and her family. When have we heard that before? You know, not only did they come out with a rule that would basically allow an employer to impose his religious objections on his employee. Think about that. Think about that if you showed up at work tomorrow and your employer's religious objections, religious views would govern your access to health care and needed preventative health care services. What's worse, they came out with another rule that's even more sweeping. They said if, you're, if your boss, if your employer has a moral objection, define that they'd be able to impose that on you. So you better believe it, we sued, and we're gonna win there because we're not just talking about women's access to needed health care, which we are, we're also talking about, you know, such an, important, such an important piece of ensuring that women have an ability to stay in school, get an education, join the workforce, continue in the workforce. We know what this is about. This isn't about religious freedom. The law already protected religious freedom through exemptions that were part of the ACA and then later addressed by the United States Supreme Court. This is not about religious freedom. What this is about is continued efforts to hold women back. And this is an administration, Make America Great Again, to me is just code for holding a whole bunch of people and a whole bunch of progress back. And so we'll continue to see him in court on issues like that. I think about Betsy DeVos, what she's doing to our students. I can't believe it. I just talked to you about the student loan work that we're doing, right? We worked so hard with the Obama administration to get in place rules that would basically say, hey, if 
you're one of these four profits out there, like a Trump University of the world, and you um, uh, basically, you know, go after and engage in predatory activity against students, and by the way, the U.S. taxpayer, because we are footing the bill for all these loans. If you do that, then we're going to turn off the spigot. And by the way, those borrowers, those students who were victims of fraud, their loans are going to be wiped clean and they're going to get a fresh start. It makes sense. They were the victims of fraud. What does Betsy DeVos come in and do? She says, we're not going to enforce that rule. Nope, I'm not interested. Now, it's no surprise, of course, given where she came from and now given the fact that she has um, hired a whole bunch of executives from the for-profit industry into the Department of Ed. But that's why we sue, because I got thousands of students here in Massachusetts who've been the victim of predatory practices who need that relief. It's just not fair. I think about Scott Pruitt, right? Now, Scott Pruitt I know because I served with him when he was the Oklahoma AG. And his playbook is the same. He is the, the attorney general who would be sent letters from the oil and gas industry. He'd cut and paste them, sometimes not always cutting and pasting them. A couple times it got through with their actual letterhead. But usually he would switch and put the Oklahoma AG's letterhead on those letters. And off they'd go to Congress or whomever into lawsuits. Well, he's doing the same thing now as our EPA administrator. It's bad. The good news, folks, is we've sued him a number of times. We've already won twice. They tried to roll back. I want you to know this, because it's important to know about the wins we're collecting along the way. They tried to roll back the limits on methane emissions. Who does that, right? It's like science, data, you know? We know. Roll it back. Why? Because it wasn't beneficial to oil and gas. So we sued, and the court sided with us and said, no, you can't do that. They also tried to roll back the, the energy efficiency standards on things like ceiling fans and appliances. Pro-consumer, again, like who does that? And we won there too. They came out with some rule the other day and we said we were gonna sue and they took it off the table. I'd like to think they were getting the message, but I don't think so. So, you know, I just want you to know that this is the work that we're doing and, and this is the reason why we're doing it because every time they do something, you know, um, I think about what it means for folks in Massachusetts. I remember that day back in January where I was literally flying into Logan Airport Saturday afternoon and it was the, the day that the travel ban 1.0 was going into effect, 1.0. So I remember asking to be brought right over to the international terminal, and I saw the most amazing thing there. I saw lawyers volunteering, showing up at the airport. I saw social workers and translators who were so upset about what was happening, showing up at the airport to offer their assistance and services. I spent the next several hours on the phone with lawyers and staff in my office, as well as folks at our major teaching hospitals who had star residents and medical fellows and personnel overseas unable to or concerned about whether or not they were going to be able to come and work here or continue to work here. The University of Massachusetts, where we had two Iranian professors of engineering who have been living and working here for a long time, teaching the next generation of engineering students here in Massachusetts who were blocked from entry as a result of that ban. I thought about and I heard from so many people in our life sciences and tech community. We are a global economy. We are a knowledge-based economy here in Massachusetts. So what the president did struck at the heart and the core of who we are as people. That's why when we filed that case, which we got into court right away, and there were other actions around the country, you know, we were joined by so many businesses and colleges and universities and our teaching hospitals and the like in solidarity because this was about Massachusetts interests at stake. It's also about American values at stake, of course, because fundamentally, travel ban 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0 are unconstitutional and un-American, and he is 0-3 against us in court, including a loss the other day. That's what, that's what that scoreboard reads. Now, I don't expect them to pay that much mind. But what I do hope and what I want for all of us is that we find ways to continue 
uh, to get busy in our communities. And again, I know the, the hard work and the activism and the engagement of so many of you. I think our job is to make sure that more people are engaged. Are we registering people to vote, including right here in Massachusetts? Are we working to do that around the country? Are we involved with organizations that we care about? I remember the story that I heard from this woman who didn't have the money to write a big check to an organization doing legal advocacy on behalf of a very scared and vulnerable immigrant community. But you know what she's doing? She's spending an afternoon a week teaching ESL to new refugees right here in Massachusetts. That's beautiful, right? So yeah, she, does, she deserves a clap. You know, there are ways for all of us to give. Are we writing letters to the editor? Are we sharing real news? Um, are we blogging? Are we documenting? Are we reaching out to family members across this country? You know, all of these things matter. They all add up. And I also think that now more than ever, it's important to focus on the local. I think about what the Republican Party did uh, over the last 10 to 15 years. They cared about who was running for school committee, who was running for town meeting, who was running in their state legislature. And you see what the map looks like now. I'd be happy to talk more about that. But you know, that's the same kind of engagement I think that, that we need. You know, we need to think about what are we doing to elect people, um, not even in a partisan sense, but who are the people who will actually stand up for American values, who will fight for people? You know, who, who do we want to be in office? And with so much money in politics, it's way too easy for the wrong guys to get in. But that's where it all comes back to us. I always say the Constitution does not begin with I, the president. It begins with we, the people. That's what this is about. So thanks for coming out tonight. And now I'd love to just open it up for some questions. OK, our first question is from Alicia LeClaire. Where's Alicia? OK, Alicia wants to know, can you tell us what generally happens when you file a lawsuit against the federal government. All right, is Alicia here? Um, how are you? Thanks for coming out. I was just reading what you all have been given. It's good, I learned something. Did everyone get this? How to connect with us? All right, um, that was great, thank you team. So Alicia, here's what happens. When we sue the federal government, it's like any other litigation. So they have an opportunity to respond. Sometimes they file something in court saying um, that case should be dismissed, judge. Sometimes they answer um, what's called answering, and you know we're off to the races in terms of, of litigation. What I've tried to do in the different lawsuits against the federal government, sometimes we've, we've gone it alone or we may have gone first, but a lot of times I think what, what's been significant here is to see the collaboration among so many state AGs. So, uh, we have a number of us who are regularly talking to one another, our teams are talking to one another, and that's why you see a lot of coordination when it comes to any number of these lawsuits where you've got many, many states on board suing the president and his administration over the latest uh, illegal or unconstitutional move. That's how it works though. And I, by the way, this isn't new. You know, 10 years ago, uh, we, we, we uh, this is the 10th anniversary, I should say, of a really significant ruling, Massachusetts versus EPA. Massachusetts, your AG's office sued George Bush's EPA for its failure to regulate greenhouse gases. And that case went up to the Supreme Court. The court decided that not only did the EPA have the authority to do rulemaking around greenhouse gases, it had the duty, okay? So we've seen this before. I remember when I was head of the Civil Rights Division, one of the lawsuits that I was involved in and lead counsel for was Massachusetts versus the Obama administration when we sued over DOMA, the Defense of Marriage Act. And you know that was, um, that was a win. We won in the Supreme Court on that. And so it's not new that a state would sue the federal government. What is new and unprecedented is the volume and also uh, the, the, the level of, of just uh, uh, egregious uh, uh, transgression when it comes to um, the, the activity of, of, of presidents and of the president and, and members of his cabinet it really is truly staggering what we're seeing. But 
you know, the good news is we, we have our recourse in the courts and that's where we'll continue to go uh, as long as they continue to do things that are illegal and unlawful. I read them? Sure, I'll try. Does, uh, does Trump have any assets in Massachusetts for us to investigate? <laughs> you think that's the first time I've been asked that question or thought that? <laughs> I don't know who asked that. Um, not that we're aware of. Um, certainly, though, it's something that I'm mindful of. I support the work of my colleagues in states where there are Trump holdings, specifically in the District of Columbia, in Maryland, in New York. Um, there, was a, there, was, there were cases filed uh, alleging correctly that he's violated the emoluments clause, which he continues to do day after day after day. Um, so we're supporting those efforts. Um, but I'm not aware of, uh, to the extent anybody is aware of, please let me know. <laughs> uh, this is from Leslie. Does your office plan to issue guidance or regulations concerning the new pay equity law? If so, when? Thank you. All right, great question, Leslie. Um, I'm really proud of this effort, you know, earlier this year. Pay equity is uh, so important, and a lot of, who isn't behind, who, who doesn't support equal pay for equal work, right? Duh. Um, I think most, most people do. Um, but here's the problem. It's never been, I think, well-defined about how to actually make it happen, you know, how to make sure that we make good on that. And I'm really proud of the law that my office worked on with the legislature this year, first of its kind in the country. And what it does is, you know, we already had equal pay for equal work on the books, but what this law does is it really works to incent a system that's going to make that real. So, for example, one of the things that it does, and we worked with lawyers both from the employer side and the plaintiff's employee side, to come up with a law that said, you know, for businesses employers, if you do a look right now at your salaries and you make an adjustment and write things, then, you know, basically for three years that'll count in terms of um, uh, defenses against uh, widespread discrimination, discriminatory employment practices. I think that's good because as we gathered with the Chambers of Commerce and other employers and businesses, you know, they, they want to do right. Who doesn't? We know that economically it's better for the bottom line, right? Corporations that have more or, more or diverse uh, uh, board membership, uh, greater, greater diversity in their board membership actually do better economically. And, you know, for far too long we've just left uh, half of our population out in so many ways. So I'm happy about the, the, the new law. It's a good law. We're looking at it right now to see if there are ways we as an office can, um, through guidance, you know, provide additional assistance. And it's going to be something that we continue to stay engaged on. And Leslie, if you want to come up and talk to my team afterwards, be happy to talk to you further or solicit your ideas. Okay. Um, I'm just going in order here. Beth. Beth asked about, I read, I read in today's Boston Globe, some municipalities are organizing to have Trump impeached for violations of the Emoluments Clause. Is this a good way to go about getting him impeached? What can we do? <laughs> um, you know, look, um, I, I think, I, I, I certainly understand the sentiment behind those efforts, and I think whatever folks want to do within their own communities is all well and good. You know, in terms of impeachment, it's going to be an action by Congress um, following the presentation of, of evidence and testimony. What I think is important right now, from where I sit, is for uh, Robert Mueller to be able to do his work, to have the resources, and to continue to work to get to the bottom as quickly as possible what happened. You know, I have a colleague in Virginia, Mark Herring, he's running for Attorney General. He's up for re-election in two weeks. And, the, and, the, and the, obviously the Virginia governor's race is on too. We still haven't looked at those voting machines. You know, I fundamentally, before next year especially, we need to get to the bottom of what happened. We need answers. And more than anything, we need to make sure that this never happens again. So let's let... <laughs> I think let's let, uh, let's let Bob Mueller do his work. Let's let members of Congress do their work on the committees, although, you know, I don't have as much hope or faith in that process. Um, but I do think that every day, people speaking out, continuing to say 
this is wrong. You know, look, so I'm a Democrat, but I work with Republicans, and within our democracy, we got to respect uh, differing views, right? And we can have policy debates and discussions, but there are some things that, as an American, are just right and wrong. And it's that fundamental. And I wish we had more people like John McCain speaking up that were willing to put their country ahead of party right now. But until then, I think it's up to all of us to speak up and speak out when things just aren't right. Um, OK. Let me, do anybody want to raise their hand, too? I, I, I'll work through a few more, but I also want you to know, just because you didn't write on a card, you, you, you could still ask a question or comment. Um, OK, this is from Deb. How do we continue to get high school kids involved in making progress on the important issues in our state right now and in the future? Well, um, God, I gotta, I, this is one of the best parts of my job. I get to see and interact with young people all the time. I spend a lot of time with young people who are organizing, not just in their high schools, but in their junior highs. Um, amazing. And I think that one thing that has come out of the November election is a whole new level of engagement and activism. And you know, as upsetting as it has been when I, when I hear parents tell about having to explain to, say, a seven-year-old son uh, what the B word is, having just heard it from the president's mouth, you know, the other side of that is I find young people, boys and girls, more engaged than ever. And that's a really good thing. So they're organizing whether it's on environmental issues or issues of health care or immigrants, um, they're standing up in their communities. The other day, I was down in Foxborough, not too far from here. I was down at Gillette because um, uh, Robert Kraft and I were, were hosting there leaders from our Game Change program. You may or may not remember, but a year and a half ago, a couple years ago, you know, I, I was asked about Deflategate and my views. And, <laughs> You have to get used to, as AG, you get asked about anything and everything, whether it's in your purview or not. My view is Tom Brady had all the you know, great lawyers in the world, and no, we weren't as an office going to be representing him, though we were asked. Um, but what I did say is that the NFL has its priorities out of place. You know, They should be focused on domestic violence and sexual assault, uh, pervasive in the league. And what happened is I received a phone call from Mr. Kraft. And he said, let's work together. And our teams got together, and we came up with this program called Game Change. And now, a year and a half later, we are in over 100 high schools and now middle schools. We just launched in middle schools with our Game Change program. And we are teaching young people, students, how to be peer leaders, how to engage in healthy relationships, respect for one another, what to do in terms of bystander intervention when you see the signs of teen dating violence or relationship violence or bullying or stalking. And, you know, I was just, I say this just because I was so moved by these young people who, through this effort, we launched, then on their own over the last year had designed their own curricula to, to supplement what we were doing, and were out there training and teaching and doing all sorts of advocacy. And it was like so inspiring to see them do this work. So look, our young people are our greatest asset. It's why somebody like me does the work that I do, because it's all about, you know, I think about my little nieces and my nephew. And I think the responsibility of all of us adults, um, and I wish there were more in charge in places of power, um, I, I, I fundamentally believe our responsibility is to leave this world a better place than the world we inherited. And that, isn't that the, the bond? Isn't that what ties us generation to generation to generation? Um, that's why we do this work. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Um, would you ever consider running for the highest office in the land in 2020? <laughs> the highest office in the land. <laughs> oh, God. I did not know she was going to ask that. You say running. Running for what? Um, <laughs> I'm running for re-election as your attorney general. I'll tell you that. I'll tell you that. <laughs> and one thing I do hope, one thing I do hope is that we see in numbers like we've never seen before people turning out to run. 
at all levels for everything. I think especially women, big time especially women, because there are too few women in the places I go. Um, and, and for us to be truly representative of our communities um, and be a representative democracy, we've got to have um, a Congress, state legislature, governors, uh, you name it, that better reflect the diversity of, of the people that we're elected to serve. So thanks for the question. We'll move, we're going to go back to the cards now. <laughs> um, this is from Linda. Okay. Uh, the laws governing the breadth and scope of the responsibilities and judgments of the federal and state politicians is mostly accessible to the public. But what if your local politicians are taking advantage of the rules for their own self-interest because those laws vary so much from town to town and are so obscure? Okay, well, I'll tell you what. You know, there are a lot of laws on the books as well as ethical obligations and requirements that require all of us in public office to play by the rules and to the extent that you believe somebody isn't playing by the rules, ethical or, or otherwise, uh, you can report them to the State Ethics Commission or to my office. Um, I do think it's really important that, that there always be integrity in government um, and to the extent, you know, there's anybody out there who's acting outside the bounds, there's a way to, there's a way to address that. Uh, Nora, what's the most effective way we can help you? Oh, I like that question too, Nora. Um, well, I'll tell you, one thing that you can do if you're not doing it already, I've got, um, I've got a couple of, of websites. I've got the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office website. I encourage all of you to go on that, and I encourage you to scroll to the bottom and then follow us on Twitter if you're not, or uh, Facebook or Instagram. I also encourage you to visit my morahealy.com site, which is a separate site, um, my political committee, and to follow us uh, there as well. Day in and day out, we're really trying to get out information to the public, you know? In the immediate aftermath of the news about Equifax, not only did we sue in court, but we put up and we continued to, to refresh what you need to do, what steps you need to take to deal with the Equifax mess. And, to the extent you can then share that with your networks, uh, that helps me a lot because it helps me get the word out. This is about protecting people, you know, standing up for people's rights and interests here in Massachusetts. And you can help me by following me and sharing what we're doing. The other thing um, is that if anybody wants to get involved in what we're doing, I am running for re-election. Um, and so it's, uh, it's, it's, I always welcome those who might be willing to organize or volunteer in their communities. Please get in touch with, with my committee about that, and there's contact information at the bottom of this sheet. Um, but, you know, mostly, folks, just keep engaged. You know, if you can talk to your grandchildren, if you can talk to your coworkers, if you can have a discourse, even and especially with people with whom you disagree, that's where we need to be. There's too much rancor. Um, the, the political discussions are too partisan, in my view, too coarse. Um, I don't even know what's news sometimes on TV. A lot of it just seems to be opinion after opinion, and who are the four people you can pop up tonight on some panel, and it's like any one of them. I mean, God. So, you know, trying to be attentive to actual news and information and then being willing to share that and engage, um, and I do think especially... You know, if you can find a way to work with somebody who's got a different view on something to find some common ground to move forward in your community, that's a really good model. You know, it's a really good, it's a really good thing to be doing. Um, registering people to vote, though, you know, sadly, we left a lot of votes on the table in Massachusetts. We just had, I live in Boston. Don't hold that against me. Um, but it's a lovely place. But we just had our mayoral primary back a few weeks ago. We had like 10% turnout, right? Did people not get the memo in November? Like, your vote matters, you know? And, and that's something that, that disheartens me. But I think continuing to encourage people to vote, registering people to vote, registering people to be active, I appreciate everything that the League is doing, spreading information. Um, that's really good. And finding and supporting good candidates for office is really important at all levels. I can't tell you how often I'm working with partners, you know? No one politician, no one government agency or office 
uh, can go this alone. It really takes partnership and collaboration. So those are some, some ideas. Um, let's see. You know, uh, Karen, do you have any suggestions for improving the ballot question process in Massachusetts? Would it be constitutional to limit ballot question uh, donations as candidate donations are limited? Okay, that's an interesting question, you know. So one of the things that I do is, as AG, one of my jobs is to review all the petitions that come in every August um, to get things on the ballot. And we have to review them in my office to make sure they're constitutional. There are certain things you can't put on the ballot under our Constitution. You can't put things on the ballot that relate to religion, for example. Um, so we have lawyers who do that review every year. I think it's kind of cool because people come in, you know, um, they've got their proposed ballot question. My lawyers will also work with them a little bit to make sure if the language isn't constitutional, they'll, you know, help guide them a little bit about the form and what needs to happen. And then a few weeks later, they come back to my office and they pick up these, we wheel out basically a shopping cart and we hand out the packets and either their questions got certified because they're constitutional and can go on the ballot or um, they get a letter saying, you know, you got to do it a different way, try it again next year. Uh, but it's great because it's like direct democracy in practice. And then, you know, people can take that if it's a certified question. They can then take that and go out and collect signatures. I saw people collecting signatures tonight, right? There you go. So I think the ballot question process is important. I think it's an important tool that allows for direct democracy. And I say that even knowing the incredible strain it puts a lot of people in my office under because we basically have a very short window to get all this done. I'll tell you one question I'm really proud to have certified this year for the first time ever. It would be, it's a ballot question that if passed, would be a resolution that allows Massachusetts to begin the process of repealing Citizens United through a constitutional amendment. We've got to get money out of politics. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Tara. Um, and yeah, I guess as to donations, look, I wish there were no money in politics. There's way too much corporate money. There's way too much anonymous money. It's bad. It's really bad for the system. And, you know, that's why I mentioned our efforts there. Relatedly, some of you have been following this Gill case in the Supreme Court on political gerrymandering. Yeah, I mean, basically, you know, a few years ago in Wisconsin, um, there was an election and the Republicans there uh, just dominated. And when they dominated, they then went about the process of rewriting the districts and basically now creating a situation where it is impossible for a Democrat to get elected in Wisconsin anywhere. So this case went up um, and is up now before the Supreme Court and Massachusetts, my office, led a brief joined by other states, 15 other states, um, that we filed in, in that case, basically saying that what Wisconsin did, that's political gerrymandering, it's unconstitutional. Some may call it part of the political process. I call it vote dilution, simple as that. So I'm hoping that we get a favorable ruling out of the Supreme Court. Hi, Maura. Um, vote dilution. You know, because it ends up, if it's so rigged, you know, things are drawn in such a way, your vote doesn't count. In the same way districts were racially gerrymandered, the same thing that's happening right now, if you look at a map, a, a, a nationwide map of the districts, it's, it's gerrymandered along political lines. That's a problem. Now, I don't care if it's in favor of Republicans or in favor of, of Democrats. Either way, it's wrong, right? You know, one person, one vote. So I'm hoping the Supreme Court does the right thing. Thank you, um, and thank you for being here tonight. I really appreciate it, and I'm sure everybody else does. Um, speaking of constitutionality, more and more I hear of, of things happening in, in Congress where Democrats are just completely shut out. Is that constitutional? And whether or not it is, how can we as individuals do anything about that? Yeah. Uh, vote them out. You know, if you're involved with swing left or any of these other, right now, the Republicans are dominating Congress. And, you know, I, um, I'm not suggesting that's a 
an evil thing or a bad thing. It just turns out that the Republicans who are in charge are, are cruel, irresponsible, and are acting in ways that are unlawful and not helpful to advancing American values. I mean, and I got to say, sometimes, you know, I left a job in private practice. I was very happy in a law firm. I had a great practice and a great life. And um, I, don't, I don't understand why these people do these jobs, you know? And at some point, I don't know if it's power or ego or what takes over, but it's frankly disgusting. And to see the gutlessness of people like Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell, I mean, give me a break. Now, I don't know enough about the process. I'm not a parliamentarian. I don't, I don't know about those rules. Um, but I do know this, that the best way to deal with it is vote them out. And so whatever you can do here to support people in other districts, adopt a district, you know, find a candidate somewhere, register, go back. College roommates, people you worked with, your kids, where are they? They're friends. You know, what are you doing um, to help support people in other districts? Um, and also take care of our own, too. You know, you got to make sure the people that you have the opportunity to vote for, that you're voting for and others are, too. So I think that's the best way to do it. And, you know, look at what's going on with health care. You seriously, I mean, I don't, again, we can, de we can debate policy, Democrat, Republican, liberal, conservative. That's cool. That's a democracy. But we have got a president of the United States who is sabotaging our health care market, as evidenced by the fact that insurers and hospitals and, and plans, everybody's speaking out against it, except for these gutless Republicans who, I guess, are about to bring up repeal and replace once more. What are they thinking? So hold them accountable and, and vote them out is what, what I would say. And it can happen. It can happen. You know, there are some great candidates running in different congressional districts. And, you know, find one you like and see what you can do. It's not just money, folks. You know, you can be part of networks. There are people who are here who are calling on behalf of candidates in other races in other districts, um, who are, are doing social media, who are doing digital, who are, you know, writing letters to editors. There's a whole bunch of things that, that we can do to help people in other places, but vote them out. Okay. No, thank you. It's a great question. Um, this is from Bree. Did the Regula did the electric reliability study take into account the decommissioning of the Pilgrim uh, power plant, which is the la and the last coal-fired electric plants? So, you know, the answer to that is uh, yes. Um, basically, a couple of years ago, my office uh, basically uh, went out and had an independent analysis. We didn't do it. Uh, we 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 went out and put together an advisory group and ended up. Um, retaining an entity to do an independent analysis of our electric reliability needs here in Massachusetts because there was a lot of talk at the time about the need to build bigger pipelines in Massachusetts. You remember? And Kinder Morgan was coming in and they were going to lay down, you know, this expansive pipe that was also going to be expensive and it wasn't the utility company that was going to pay for that, of course or the gas company, it was going to be us as ratepayers. And uh, I heard from a lot of folks on this, and, you know, I'm sorry, I'm a lawyer. I wanted to get the facts. I wanted to get the data and the information. So we went out and had an independent evaluation done, this independent study. And basically, they came back saying that for purposes of keeping the lights on here in Massachusetts, we don't need to build a whole bunch of new pipeline infrastructure that, by the way, is going to become obsolete uh, at some point in time. We can work with what we have. You know, uh, we've got a renewables market, we've got, you know, energy efficiency, and yeah, we've got capacity that maybe can be expanded on already existing pipelines. But I think what our study pretty clearly reflected is that there wasn't a market need for it. Now, I think we were ultimately um, uh, affirmed in that by the very fact that Kinder Morgan pulled out, because we also went to court to say, hey, if you're going to build pipeline, um, here in Massachusetts, put, it, put that risk on investors, not on the backs of electric ratepayers. And the Supreme Court here found in our favor. So once they learned that, that, that it was not going to be you and me paying uh, for that construction, they remarkably enough pulled out. It wasn't a good deal. So, um, you know, Pilgrim is a plant that is decommissioned. We're a year or two away from that. I continue to uh, closely follow what's happening there because there have been documented safety issues. And, you know, it's so important that not only uh, 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 things be safe for workers, for residents, for our community, 
um, but also that that it, that the the closer closure is done correctly, and that includes uh, the storage of, of 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 spent fuel and the like, as that is is decommissioned. So we continue to pay attention to that issue as well. But yes, Bree, that did take account of what our energy market was going to look like and our energy needs here um, with the the closure of Pilgrim. Um, another question from Claire. This is about. Uh, gas supply manipulation report, considering lawsuit on behalf of ratepayers. So some of you may have read a couple weeks ago, there was a report that was issued by EDF, the Environmental Defense Fund, um, a study done that um, raised concerns about whether or not Eversource was manipulating the energy market, uh, specifically allegations that it was reserving space um, and then not actually buying up uh, that space, and then the result is that you know electric prices were gonna, that prices were going to go up and did go up. So um, you know I want you to know that we're reviewing it. Um, I think that that um, you know we'll, we'll, we will look at it, of course, and FERC may look at it, of course. Some of this though does have to do with the very real way that energy markets work and the way that distribution companies are actually required to buy it and make sure that they've reserved enough on a daily basis as we go forward. Yep. Hi, thank you for, for coming tonight and um, thanks for everything you do for, on behalf of all the residents of Massachusetts. So um, just, you mentioned pipelines. So Access Northeast, which is a pipeline that um, was proposed by Spectra Energy, now by Enbridge, who bought mm -hmm. Spectra. Um, it's sort of, rumor is that it's slated to come back and the way they want to pay for it is through a regional tariff through ISO New England mm -hmm. um, imposing this on us. Is there any way that we as, as one state in New England can fight this? Well, I don't know the exact answer to your question. I do know that I'd be happy to follow up and have the right person in my office talk to you more about it. Um, you know, it, uh, I'm mindful of, of people's concern about that pipeline. Uh, my job as ratepayer advocate, too, is to make sure that ratepayers aren't being taken advantage of when it comes to, to costs and what is passed on by these entities, by utilities, to actual folks like you and me, whether it's residential or commercial customers. So let me talk, well, I'll make sure that we get a better answer for you than that, but um, I don't know the specifics of how ISO would work uh, with any individual state as opposed to sort of a regional effort with respect to a tariff. But I'll tell what's your name? Bree. Oh, she said, okay. We'll make a note. Here, Deb. Yeah, you got that? I, here's Bree's card. So, so we can make sure. I'll have, uh, I'll have my team follow up with you, okay? Make sure she gets her, her telephone number on that if she wants to write on it. Great. Okay. Um, there's great, like, band practice going on behind. Can you hear? It's good. Go Rebels. All right, uh, Denise, is it legal for an insurance company to change their formulary of covered drugs anytime they want? It seems like false advertising or bait and switch to me. We signed on expecting a drug to be covered and then it changed. Well, Denise, I'm gonna give your card right to Deb and you're gonna get a call tomorrow from my healthcare division. I think the answer is it depends um, and we would just need to know more about how this was done. But I will, um, you know, I want, I want folks to know, you probably don't know, we have a healthcare division in your office, okay? And we spend a lot of time um, investigating and sometimes bringing cases against healthcare providers or home health agencies or drug companies or um, others, you know, in the healthcare system that we believe have engaged in unfair deceptive practices. That's the consumer protection code language for what is illegal, what is unlawful. And um, we also have a hotline, and we're regularly getting calls from people who have, who believe that, for example, I don't know how many times you've gotten a, a bill from an insurance company, and you thought, wait a second, I thought I was covered for that? Like, what, what is this bill I'm getting stuck with? Well, sometimes that's, that's unlawful. What they're doing, what they're, they're sticking you with is actually wrong. You know, they're not allowed to do that. Call my office. And we literally will work, I have mediators assigned to work with you directly on, on those issues. So here, this is for Denise. 
Um, Anne, as privatization converts our school districts to quasi-public institutions, how can we inform parents about the dangers of uninformed uh, school charters? Yeah, you know, this is part of the problem with like a Betsy DeVos led administration and Department of, of Education. Um, you know, I'm uh, the proud product of public schools. My mom was a, a elementary school nurse. My dad was a public high school uh, history teacher, social studies teacher and coach. He was also head of his teachers union. And, you know, I am so proud of the education that Tara and I and our three brothers and sisters uh, received, you know. And public education, the cool thing in Massachusetts is we actually bake that into our constitution. Every, every child here is entitled to an education. And I think that Massachusetts has so much to be proud of, including having the first public school in the entire country in history. So we need to stand by those values. They've served us well. They're the leveler. Um, you know, to me, the family that you're born into, the wealth that you're born into, the poverty that you're born into should not be determinative of your course or your ability to maximize your potential or be all you can be. There's also a recent study. What was I reading last night? I don't know. But the point about public education, I think there's, a, I think there's someone in the Atlantic this month on, on this, um, related, not exactly on it. But the point about public education, how it served our country so well, that if you go back, our country hasn't always, in fact, we haven't, all, we haven't had the highest test scores of, of countries around the world but we've had the greatest success in part because you know, public education, and I'm not saying this in an artful way, but the point of public education where everybody can go and mix with one another, what that yields in terms of people's ability to operate successfully in the workplace, operate successfully as adults in life, you know, it's fundamental. So boy, uh, do I get upset about efforts to privatize education, which is a public good, and we need to support public education. Uh, I'm very concerned about the direction of the U.S. Department of Ed. Um, and, you know, while we need to find ways to um, educate all of our children, you know, and some of that may be through different kinds of settings, uh, boy, do we ever need to stand by public education in our public schools. So... It really, it really bothers me, you know? I get so mad when I read about the fees, you know, the fees that, that families are having to pay for band, you know, or for athletics or for, you know, the normal stuff or like why you walk into, I mean, public schools are where it's at and why people fundamentally don't, uh, some people don't understand that. It just, it, it boggles my, my mind. So um, there's not always much I can do as your AG about that, but um, that's where I am in terms of my, my position. Um, this is from Dan. He's a a person with, a, with Parkinson's disease and a Parkinson's advocate. And I'm concerned about health benefits with what's happening to the ACA. You know, Dan, my heart goes out to you and so many folks who are in your position, those with pre-existing conditions, those tonight, you know, who are wondering about their sick kid or loved ones. Um, you know, it's, it's, this is what I mean about the cruelty of the president's decision to sabotage access to health care. Because this isn't a fight about insurance markets and who's paying what. This is about life or death for people. And this is about fundamentally whether people are going to be able to have access to the care they need. You saw what happened the other day here in Massachusetts where the connector had to raise jack premiums, right? What does that mean? It means that people won't have access to health care. And so, Dan, that's why we're in court. Um, I plan to be successful in that lawsuit. And we're going to continue to advocate to Congress to, to take action in the face of an irresponsible, cruel president and his administration. Um, how are we doing on? Three or four more questions? Okay. Uh, how can we make Trump pay taxes? How can we make them public record? Uh, I don't know. We're working on that. Um, there are some amendments going around state by state. You know, you can't be on the ballot, which I support. I mean, I think about what I have to disclose to somebody running for office or in office. Give me a break. Of course he should make his taxes. Anybody who wants to be on the ballot like that for president of the United States should have to disclose taxes and a whole bunch of meaningful financial information. How else do you know the conflicts? Yeah. Hi. Um, my name is Nada, and I'm so happy that you're here. I'm thrilled. Uh, my question goes back to the Equifax breach. Um, 
what exactly is Massachusetts and the other states looking for with respect to a remedy in the courts for the Equifax breach? And I think I'm asking that question because um, in your documentation, um, it, you know, a credit freeze is the best thing to do. And I forget how many millions of people, you said possibly everyone in this room is affected. Well, if everyone has to pay $5 to TransUnion and $5 to Experian, mm -hmm. Th those are windfalls for those companies. Mm -hmm. And I would think that Equifax somehow would be liable yep. for some kind of monetary damages or something, whether to the state for the good of the, um, the good of the everyone. Um, I don't think they should get away with it. Again, it's, it's, $10, it's $10 for one person. Yep. But when you add that, and I'm not a mathematician, so I don't know how many millions well, of dollars that comes to. Well, it gets pretty big pretty quickly. To. Totally agree with you. Navin? Not a, nice to meet you. So here's the deal, Equica, Equifax, we're suing them, this is what we want. I want money back for everybody here who had to pay out for a credit freeze, who has to pay out for credit monitoring for the next you know, number of years. They need to make sure that they are paying directly back in people's pockets for any expense incurred or in the future to be incurred as a result of this breach, including identity theft. You know, I know from this work, because we've investigated a ton of these data breaches, you know, sometimes you don't see the identity theft in the immediate aftermath. You may see it in several months. You may see it in a year or two. So the, the, the first order of business is Equifax has got to pay big and make every single consumer whole here in Massachusetts and all across this country. That's the first thing in my lawsuit. The second thing is they need to pay a big penalty. You know, this needs to be a message sent to the industry to reform their practices. And third, they need to reform their practices, which is also why I'm not waiting for the lawsuit, although we're actively engaged in that. They filed a motion to dismiss the other day against us in court. Can you believe that? So, well, I can believe it. Um, but we're not waiting. So here's what the legislation that my office helped draft does. You should be able to, all of us should be able to, and this is what I hope becomes national legislation, we uh, should be able to get a credit freeze or unfreeze a credit freeze whenever we want for free, as often as we want. This is our data, remember? They don't get that, they don't care about that, but it's actually our data. So free credit freezes. The other thing is, if they're gonna collect this data, they need to encrypt it, you know? Basic, they need to encrypt it. If they want to sell this data, or if other companies, like other credit card companies or banks or retailers want to buy our data from one of these credit reporting agencies, then they need to get our permission to do it, right? You know, they should have to come to us and get our permission. The other thing is, these credit reporting agencies have got to get together and there needs to be a one-stop portal. You shouldn't have to go, as I had to go, to three different places, right, to request three different credit freezes, or copies of your report. That's another thing. We should have access to not just our credit report, but our credit score whenever, whenever we want it. So that's what this legislation would, done, would do. It's the first of its kind in the country. I hope it sails through our state legislature. If you know anybody there, please make calls, tell them to get behind this bill. Um, but that's what we need in terms of reform. It's outrageous, but another example of where the incentives have been all wrong, have been backwards, and, you know, it's on the backs of, of, of people, you know, like you. It's just not right. So that's what, I think that's what this whole experience has made really, really clear and why I was so adamant about being out of the gate with a lawsuit. And also, go on my website. We continue to post information there um, for, in terms of tips. If you haven't checked your credit report lately, you get three free credit reports a year. I do think it's worthwhile to check that, make sure that what they have listed actually reflects, you know, all the credit cards you have or the bank accounts you have. Make sure that you're checking that now. If credit freeze isn't for everybody, if you're in the middle of refinancing a mortgage or you need a car loan or a student loan, then, you know, obviously you need access to credit. But after you do that, you know, my view is shut it down for the time being because that's a way to protect against somebody else opening a new account in your name. Two more? Okay. We'll see if I can combine. Um, a few of these. And, and uh, okay. Uh, we just did that. Supreme Court ruled the main campaign. Yeah, yeah. Okay, we talked about campaign donations. Um, 
Okay, I think that, why don't I talk about criminal justice reform? I have two questions about criminal justice reform. It's a really important topic. It's a live topic right now in our legislature. I'm somebody who was a civil rights lawyer um, and was also you know, a prosecutor. And I believe deeply that now is the time for needed criminal justice reform in Massachusetts. I think it's a good example of, you know, in the midst of everything else that's going on, what can we do here at the local level? that'll make a difference, that'll be meaningful in people's lives. You know, I think criminal justice reform should include a few things. Emphasis on treatment. You know, we've got people, not just young kids, but others, especially now with this opioid crisis, who are um, coming into the system uh, fed by addiction or, um, or maybe, you know, uh, a bad move or bad mistake as a young person. It seems to me we're smart, we'll be smarter and better off if we create situations where we're supporting diversion programs, where we're providing resources to people, including for treatment for substance use and mental health issues. So often in our district courts, if you show up on any given morning, you'll see so many people who have one or both of those that somehow landed them in, in the system. I think we do need to reform some of our sentencing practices, and I've been out there as somebody who supports the repeal of certain mandatory minimums uh, for certain drug offenses. I think that's important. I think on the back end, we need to support reentry programs, you know, but this takes money, it takes resources. Instead of letting people out, let's, let's, you know, let's get them on a path to success and make sure that they're getting uh, the counseling and the services that they need so that they can be successful when they get out. Job training, uh, you name it. And, you know, because people are going to get out and, and the vast majority of people are going to get out. And it's beneficial to all of us as neighbors, um, as members of the community, for them to be successful in that. So, you know, I think that we need more when it comes to better reentry programs, support for um, some of the programs that are already in place that we just need to, to amplify. So those are some of the things that my office is working directly on. I also, if you go to my website, <clears throat> I have a letter that, um, that sort of outlines where the positions that we've taken as an office, you know, there are things like raising the amount that um, th that that uh, amount of money before you can charge a felony, you know, for stealing because uh, for far too long it's been too low, and unfortunately, you know, a lot of people were getting charged with felonies when we we just need to to raise the limit. I think we have an agreement of district attorneys there as as well. So there are some small things like last year. You know, when I supported, we, we got behind getting rid of the automatic suspension of driver's licenses for those who've been convicted of, of drug possession offenses. You know, that's important because if you've got that hanging over you, it impacts your ability to, you know, not only get a license, but potentially get a job, get to school, take care of yourself or your family. So I encourage you to, to read what I've got up there in terms of, of criminal justice reform. Um, but I really hope that here in Massachusetts we can we can make good on that this year. And I'm gonna to continue to work with the legislature on that. Um, let's see, uh, how can we as individuals combat the far right and their devaluation of our rights uh, when we're, oh, we talked about this, Doug. Okay, good. Does anybody else have uh, one more question? Sure. I'll do these last two and then we'll, we'll draw to a close here. This is kind of a long question, I'm sorry, so I'll try to make it quick. Um, there's essentially a very important bill that we need to pass here in Massachusetts. It's called House Bill 742, and essentially it amends the victim compensation statute. Um, just so everybody here kind of understands what's going on, um, families of murdered loved ones can apply for state assistance in providing modest burial costs. Um, however, there is an exemption clause that says that if the individual has been seen to have in any way contributed to um, their own death, they are denied those funds. So as a result, many families are unfortunately um, denied um, the common decency of um, a proper burial. Um, so this amendment essentially addresses that. So my question is for you is, I'm asking, but honestly, I'm begging for your support. Um, and you know, if you could just um, please just join us 
Um, this means the world to the survivor community, and honestly, they're always in my heart. Um, that's all I ask. Jackson. And that's a really important, um, you know, it's an important issue. I was just talking about this meeting with some folks last week about it. We want to make sure that victims, survivors, and families of victims have, uh, don't have to, to be re-traumatized. They've already been traumatized once through the murder or the loss of their loved one. What we don't want to see happen is financial hardship become a way to further re-traumatize them. And you can imagine how traumatic it is if they're not able to pay a burial or funeral expense. Um, under our state victim compensation statute, if you're the victim of a crime, a violent crime, your family, then you're gonna be entitled to compensation, which my office actually administers. I have a victim comp division. And uh, people will apply and then we'll give out the victim comp money. I give out all of it every year. Whatever I get, we give it out. Um, and it goes to medical bills, counseling too, because a number of people will need counsel counseling, and also the funeral and burial expense. There is an exemption that said that if you were somebody who contributed to the commission of the crime, um, your family wasn't gonna be eligible. I have worked in my office is working directly with Representative Carvalho on changes to that language, because again, I wanna make sure that families are not re-traumatized, and um, I think it, it, it uh, you know, it's really, it's a heartbreaking scenario. So I think there are ways to do that, and we're going to continue to work with the representative and advocates to get that done, and my hope is we can get that done this year. And, you know, I, um, I want you to know, too, when it comes to the victims, you know, the first call I made after Las Vegas, I made a couple of calls. One, I made calls to some of the families that I'd come to know through Sandy Hook, uh, through here, through Orlando, and I reached out to them because you can imagine what that experience recalls. Um, but the next call I made was to my Republican colleague, Adam Laxalt, who is the Nevada Attorney General. And I said to him, let, let us help you. We've been through the marathon bombing. Um, we understand what you're going to be confronting here. And I was really proud. I want you to know that we sent advocates out from our office um, to work with them directly. I met with them this morning, and it was incredible, the stories that they told me about their experiences. They were in an in a indoor arena, and, um, and basically their job was to greet uh, family members as they, they came through, and the lines, you know, just went on for days, um, and to help them navigate through accessing counseling, accessing the Red Cross, literally collecting their possessions that were uh, left um, on that, that concert field. And, you know, that's the humanity of the work. I mean, that's, that's what we're about. And I was really proud of our team, your team, being able to do that. And it's not a time for politics. Um, you know, it was the right thing to do. I did um, speak with him, though, more recently. And he and I, I want you to know from that experience, and again, this is a Democratic G and a Republican AG, we've co-authored a letter. We're now up to, I think, 35 other AGs, and it's growing. Uh, to support the federal legislation on bump stocks and eliminating bump stocks. So let that be, you know. Um, I just wanted to share that, that piece, having met with those folks this morning. Yeah, last one. Hey, thanks for coming. Um, sure. My question is something that um, goes to something you said earlier, which was one person, one vote. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if there's anything we can do on the individual or community or state level to get rid of the electoral college. Yeah. Well, I think that there are organizations and others that'd be good for you to connect with. And I'm happy if you want to come speak to us after, Deb can give you, you know, some of those. But um, yeah, I mean, the popular vote. I mean, we, we don't have to revisit the last few elections. Um, but uh, I, I know you know, I know it's an important issue, it's an important policy issue, and be happy to connect you. My office directly, and I can't think of a way that I specifically can, can, can work with that, but um, I, I know we know the organizations that you can get involved with. Um, Marsha, do you have any, any closing thoughts? Are we good? Yeah? We, we, you Marcia? kept talking, Marsha Hirschberg, you kept talking about finding common ground, and the League of Women Voters sponsors such a group, 
and we're next meeting November 8th at the Westwood Library, and we have people from all political persuasions. We speak in a peace circle. So it's the way to find somebody who differs politically from you to find solutions. So all of you come. Terrific. Well, that is a great way to end everything. Um, thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you for caring about your community. Thank you for caring about your country and, and future generations. And let our office continue to be a resource to you. You can contact us online or through email or Facebook or Twitter. And, um, and tell me what I need to know. But, you know, again, I just really appreciate y'all coming out tonight. And um, I just beg of you, and I know you will, just stay active and stay engaged. And um, we will all move forward together. Thank you. If Charlotte Schoenthaler is here, Carol O'Neill, and Meg Duncan, if you want to come see me, come down this way and I'll talk to you.